This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 91 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Omega Fields, the world's best omega-3 supplements for horses. And today we have two women from the San Ynez Valley. This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thank you for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month, and I have my producer, Coach Jen, with me today. How are you, Jen? Hi-ho, Debbie. How are you? I'm good. You've been riding lately? I see how busy you are since you've been back from your vacation. I'm just hoping you still have some horsey time. I did get some good ride times in right after we got back back from vacation. As a matter of fact, that's the first thing I did. Oh, good. <laughs> I bet you missed it. You missed it a little bit when you were out. Uh, you were on a sail Went for a cruise, vacation, yes. Right? I, it doesn't matter where we go on vacation. I miss it. Mm, I'm, I'm nice. one of those really boring horse people. And <laughs> if it weren't for the fact that Glenn forces me to get out into the world, all of my vacations would be spent probably at home riding my horse. Yeah, exactly. Well, at least you get out of the house. That's yeah, that's good. true. See, it's I do get health, out of the this house. This is a healthy Absolutely. thing that you do. That's yeah. Right. And it was, uh, it was especially sweet for me because right before we left on vacation, uh, Nigel and Scooter, our pony, had been mixing it up in the pasture, so Nigel was on the injured reserve lift. So I hadn't ridden him for almost a month by the time we got home from vacation. Oh, I didn't know that. It must have been high as a kite. Well, Nigel? he was a little <laughs> naughty. <laughs> <laughs> Did you stay on top? He was a little naughty. Well, I had take, I took him out. Or right the day we got vac- home from vacation, I took him out and I just did some long lining with him because I didn't really have time to get everything together and go for a ride. Had yeah, about 15 good. minutes to spare. So I thought, oh, we'll just go throw the long lines on him. We'll walk and trot around the arena, arena for 10 minutes and we'll be done. That's good. And wouldn't you know it? He was, he was naughty. <laughs> <laughs> I would know that. <laughs> Even though he's an energy preserver, but you know, yes. that they can only pinned up so much. Well, no. yeah. And I think, I think he liked vacation. He said, you know, I would really <laughs> like to just stay on vacation. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Who are you? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much how it went down. Oh, uh, well, that's good. Thank God for a little long lining time and, you know, a little, uh, a little groundwork, yes, a little memory. I, I, I channeled my inner Monty because very I good. really wanted to be mad at him. <laughs> Aww. He, he was a little stinker and he leaped up in the air and I couldn't keep a hold of him because I don't long line him in a round pen. I just long line him in the arena. So. So mm-hmm. it's like, oh, sorry, he weighs 1,200 pounds and I don't. Yeah. <laughs> so I held on as best I could. And then he decided to rip around the arena a little bit and wrap the lines all around his body. Oh, how exciting. Yes. Yeah, that yeah. is fun to watch. Yeah, it's very fun <laughs> to watch. And I really wanted to be angry at him. And I just, I took a deep breath. Yeah. I turned my back to him for a minute. And I said, this, yeah. it's completely unnecessary. It, it will be in no way constructive. He he leaped and cavorted and wrapped the lead ropes, the uh, long lines around him, and that's just the way it is. And I turned back and I walked up to him, and it was very interesting because when I approached him, I could tell he expected to be in trouble. Ah, uh, there's an old old throwback moment. Yeah, yes. He, his, you know how when they when they expect to be in trouble, the ears prick and the eyes get giant, and they kind of get yeah. back on their haunches. Exactly. And he did that. So, okay, I'm channeling my inner Monty. What should I do? So I, again, took a deep breath and I turned away, my three quarters away, and um, took a deep breath and stepped back from him. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, The same body movement I would feel as if I was inviting him to follow me in the pasture when I catch him every day. Mm -hmm. Good. Did you breathe out? Tried to breathe out. Mm -hmm. Breath. and as soon as the corner of my eye, I saw him relax, yeah. I reapproached. And it was a very different horse. I got him all on. He stood stock still, didn't, relaxed, dropped his head, stock still while I untangled him. And he, he, he looked like, he looked like a snarled up piece of, of fishing line. It was a hot mess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> got him all untangled. Yeah. Took a deep breath and we walked around. And it was very interesting because not the typical um, elevated adrenaline. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm going to puff up and be naughty and just goof off and be silly and woohoo. <laughs> Not, which is what I usually expect to get. Didn't. We went back to being focused. Ah, we went back yeah. to trying and I was so excited. 
<laughs> yeah, he became a professional again. He's like, oh, that's right. That's, that's right. That's right. I don't have to get in trouble. I, I didn't engage him in his antics. You know, because he likes to engage in antics, and I didn't. And thank you very much, um, Monty Roberts and Equus, to, for helping me learn that. Yay! That's great. Thanks, Jen. Yay. Thanks for that. <laughs> Thanks for actually being a good student and and putting it to work. Uh, this is what people need to do. They need to mix it up with their horses, you know, and and experiment, push back, sure, see experiment. see if it works. See if it works. You know, I challenge people yeah. to now. Don't just give up on the first try. That you didn't, Jen. You you actually, you know. Stuck to it, oh, seeing see that it had worked with other people. Yeah, so sometimes darn it. it works, sometimes it doesn't. But it, I've, I'm getting to that point where it's a little more comfortable for me to say, okay, I didn't get the result I wanted, but I got a result. Hmm. And Very a result good. is always good. It yeah, might it not is. be the one I expected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, result but it's a learning, a, le- a learning result. That's good. It's a learning result, and I can take that and learn from it. Do I need to change something? Do I fix something? Do I ask someone for help? And I use that as one of those little moments like, okay, that's not the result. I kind of thought I wanted to have, but here's a result and here's an opportunity for me to try and deal with this situation differently than the last time I was in this situation. Because the last time I was in, in this situation, um, the end result was less than what I wanted. I ended up with a horse who was tired, exhausted, um, a little upset with me, and I ended up with a ho- horse that I was very upset with. Mm. So I was like, well, that's not, not the goal. We, that's not what not we want. Goal. We want this all to end up like, oh, cool. We can do that again. That's right. And that's right. Yay. Perfect. Yay. That's the relationship you want. And, and you know, every relationship goes through that. So Absolutely. the fact that you're trying to come out on the other end happy and together, that's yeah. that's and it'll, warms my heart. It'll, it'll stay that way forever. It's always going to be that way. It's never going to be yeah. a case of it's always going to work perfect. It's a relationship, wow. not a computer program. Wow, no, wouldn't program. that be great? But no, it's a relationship. <laughs> exactly right. And that is the word. That is the word. Yeah. So, and you're going to hear about a little bit about that today, too. We've got two women that are um, across the spectrum, but they live in the same area. It's so interesting. And they have been around the Monty Roberts concepts that you were just talking about peripherally pretty much their whole lives. So it's interesting to hear their perspective, their disciplines, and how they go about uh, keeping horses in their lives. Oh, cool. Well, let's get started right after this from our title sponsor, Omega Fields. Your horse is your partner in sport, in leisure, and just in life. To keep him at his peak performance and optimal health, a solid nutritional foundation is key. Ideally, horses are able to graze fresh, growing grasses, which most closely mimic their natural diet. But that may not always be possible, and we may need to supply some of those missing ingredients in today's diets and provide more functional foods. One component of a horse's diet that is often underfed are omega-3 fatty acids. While more prevalent in fresh forages, harvested forages are lower in omega-3 fatty acids due to their more advanced maturity. Obviously, grasses and legumes have to grow to a sufficient height in order to be harvested, while foraging patterns of horses show great preference for shorter, less mature plants. That's why modern horsemen and horsewomen trust Omega Horse Shine to provide a powerful, bountiful source of omega-3 fatty acids for their equine partners. Look for Omega Horse Shine from Omega Fields at your local tack and feed supplier, or you can find them online at omegafields.com. Yanina Mearns owns the Om El Arab farm in the picturesque San Inez Valley in California. The name Om El Arab translates to mean mother of all Arabians. And the breeding program there began 40 years ago in the Black Forest of Germany before it moved to the San Inez Valley. The Om El Arab breeding program is acclaimed as a world leader in producing world, international, and national champions. Janina has recently raised the bar in producing a phenomenal young filly, Om El Aradidi, born in at the Om El Arab farm right there in the San Inez Valley, and now holds the distinction as one of the most expensive female Arabians of any age ever sold at auction. Welcome, Yanina Mers. Am I saying that correctly? Yes, you are. Thank you. Well, I'm so glad to be here on the site of Om El Arab. 
Am I saying that correctly? Yeah, we we say Om El Arab. Om El Arab. Mm-hmm. And it's a beautiful farm. And it's in the middle of the San Inez Valley, which the funny part about that is I'm actually from here. And mm-hmm. so rarely do I get to do an interview with somebody who's actually from here. And so I'm pleased today to be able to get you to um, represent the Arabian breed. First of all, you are a good representation of the Arabian breed. And not only that, you've had some huge successes just recently, which I'm excited to hear about. And I and I wanted to go right to the top. One of the top breeders, one of the top people are influencing the breed and ask you a little bit about the future of the breed. Does that sound like a good topic for today? Sure. Great. Great. Well, tell us a little bit about Siggy, your mom. I know we've lost her just this last year. And you're, are you third generation? Um... Let's see. I I actually don't really even know how many generations of Arabian breeders. Or uh, okay, I'm the second generation of Arabian. No, I have to backtrack. I'm the third generation of Arabian breeders. But back in Europe, in Romania, my my family um, bred horses for gen- many many generations on both sides of my mother's family. So her father um, bred a th- his family bred a draft horse, a type of draft horse, and um, and actually her mother's side of the family did too because mm-hmm. they worked the land with it with the horses. The working yeah, equids, working, yeah, working, horses. working horses. And so I would have to really research to see how many generations of My a breeder goodness. I really am, but for sure, third generation Arabian horse breeder. Arabian horse breeder, mm-hmm. for sure, a third generation, because your grandfather bought for your mother mm-hmm. the foundation mare or a mare, an Arabian mare that she started breeding with first? So actually, um, she actually went to Poland and bought several horses for and including two of them for my, for her father, and so um, he ended up. So I I don't know who really started it first, but he was the one that got her into horses when she was eighteen, um, in a bit of a roundabout way, mm-hmm. um, because he uh, had come to Germany and had um, you know they were refugees from Romania and had come to Germany and had made a little bit of money by then and um, wanted to start breeding again, and so he sort of got that going. Whereas my mom. Um, didn't really do anything with horses until she was 18 years old. So it was amazing that she uh, was able to um, grasp, uh, really grasp the, the bre- grasp breeding mm-hmm. so quickly and, mm-hmm. and to make it to the top so fast. Yeah, pretty quickly. And mm-hmm. she was able to spend her whole life in horses mm-hmm. too? Yeah. Nonstop. Nonstop. That's hard to do. And we, we really, um, she started 47 years ago. And this farm has um, survived solely on breeding horses. We don't really have a, you know, f- we don't really have a trainer here. We we don't have any outside income. We really, truly just breed horses. Mm-hmm. Well, I must say they are beautiful horses too. So you went straight to the top with that. Very, very talented horses too. We'll hear a little bit about that. But, uh, but you in your own right are a horsewoman who's grown up with horse people all around you too. You went to UCSB, the local University of California, Santa Barbara. I did. And I chose that school so that I could stay close to home and continue working with the horses. Um, And I really, I I guess as a little bit of a rebellious, during my rebellious stage, I thought I would do something different. I studied psychology, but then as I was doing that, I realized I had horses in my blood and, Mm -hmm. and here I am, you know, I was back I graduated and then I was back here on the farm immediately. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Immediately. And your brother helps a little bit too. The he farming. does. He does the farming. So he's some, the other parts of the family, you know, they were horse breeders and then they were, um, they were farmers and also grape growers. And so he owns a company here in town that, um, manages vineyards. And so, and then he also has a company, a hay company. And so he loves the farming side of it. It's nice to have somebody in the hay business in your family when you own horses, right? And that's Ben. For sure. And yes, that's Ben. <laughs> we all call him Benny, Benny Mers, but professionally he's Ben. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, you're a sister, so you can get away with Benny. All right. But I won't. <laughs> well, I wanted to talk a little bit right out of the shoot about this success that you've just had. I know it's been a dry, for the Arabian industry, maybe I can say the horse industry, it's been a dry few decades, really. Um, very few pockets of streamlined success over the last 30 years or so. But you came out of the shoot with a beautiful, what do you call her, a strawberry roan? What do you call her? You You know, we don't really call Arabians roans. Oh, what do you call her color? So I guess maybe 
I guess she would be a she would be a strawberry gray. Strawberry she's gray. Just yes, light. She's just like she's just like gray. I mean, she'll be gray. She she's should be white. Absolutely soon. beautiful. Thank Aridite. You. Aridite. Omel Aridite. And so she um, she is four generations are breeding, and um, but by an outcross stallion. So her sire um, is a current world champion stallion, and um, he's com- we've never actually used his particular bloodlines, and. Her mother is a very, very beautiful flea bitten mare that we have here on the farm named Omel Excella. And, um, one of the things that she is, she's a tiny bit shy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for Arabian horses, Arabian show horses, you want them to have tons of confidence. And she does at home, but she doesn't really in the show ring. So she's one of the most beautiful mares I've ever seen in my entire life. But she's just a touch shy. And, um, and I thought to myself, who could we breed her to that would help with that? And, this stallion EKS Alejandro came to mind because he is a show horse yeah. par excellence. I yeah. mean, he comes into the ring and whether you love him or not, he gives you goosebumps because of that, sh- that attitude that he has. Yeah. And, um, so I said to my mom, I have this really wild idea. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, you know, I, I, let's breed her to Alejandro. And so she said, I, I, it had crossed her mind too. Oh, that's great. And so we bred her to Alejandro and we didn't really tell anybody about it. Um, we kept it kind of a secret just because it was super outside the box for our particular style of breeding. We breed, you we usually breed like to like, and this horse was just very different to our kinds of horses. Um, and my mother passed away May 10th last year. And on June 24th, um, this gorgeous, gorgeous filly was born. And it was just, I, I had never seen a foal like her mm. ever. Um, and I've seen, I mean, we breed some, we breed some really, really beautiful horses, really beautiful horses. And this filly was just, she was my mother's breeding ideal. Yeah. Oh, and so, that's nice to and, hear. and my breeding ideal as well. I mean, for, for, uh, she was, she is just outstanding. And, um, and I knew that I, uh, you Did know, you know it as soon as she hit as, the ground? As soon as, as soon as I laid eyes on her. Yeah. I mean, she's just, you just know. And you know, and she was, when she stood up for the first time, you just, she was tall. She was long legged and gorgeous bodied and this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful face and gigantic eyes and the sweetest personality you could ever envision. When did she show that showmanship In, part? The, imme- immediately, immediately. Immediately. So the attitude. Daddy, like, daddy was there, huh? It was crazy, crazy, crazy. Because she looks very much like her mother. Very, very much. I mean, um, so yes, phenotypically, she's very much like her mother. But then she has all that extra attitude. Um, it's She's very special. And then very next day, we brought her out into this little indoor arena that you can see behind you. Uh-huh. And she just had her little tail up and just showed so much confidence, you know, where you just, it was just, Fast late, forward, just a, she's eight months old and you have her over in Scottsdale. I believe yeah, I have to backtrack a little bit. So, oh, okay. I, so it sort of spread like wildfire that this foal was born. Oh, everybody knew people you just couldn't knew. keep it a secret. People just knew we have visitors that come all the time That's and it just true. spread, uh, that there was a Philly born that was exceptional. Mm. And I had offers that were quite high already, um, from the beginning and people, um, were, messaging me from around the world, asking me to price her. And I said, I can't, I can't, I don't know how to price this filly. Mm-hmm. To me, she is so great that she's going to have to set her own value. And, um, and so I was approached by another local by Greg Galoon and he was putting together an auction with, um, with an, another, with Jeff Sloan, who's an, who's another, um, Arabian horse, uh, breeder. And they asked me to put Aridite in the auction. And at first I thought, that is crazy. I would never put this filly in this auction. But the more I thought about it, I thought, because, you know, auctions are a risk. Yes. They are a huge risk. You, you never know. You don't. You, it's, it's on any day, right? Once you consign, you really don't know. And um, but I thought about it and it became sort of a calculated risk. And I thought she will set her own value. She'll set her price. Bit risky, but you it took it. It was risky, and I took it. Mm-hmm. And um, so when she was weaned, and then at the end of November, she went to Scottsdale to be with the other horses that were going to that auction. <clears throat> and she was really just a, I mean, 
you know, five month old baby by then. Mm. And she just, they would send me pictures periodically and she just got better and better. She, she did exactly what I hoped she would and sort of into. knew she would do, mm-hmm. but you know what? You never, ever know with a baby. No. You never know. Um, and when I find, when I saw her in the beginning of the Scottsdale show, which is a two week show that we have in February, um, and this auction was at the end of the show, she really blew my mind. I mean, mm. she had just truly developed into something spectacular. spectacular. And, um, and people had flown in also from around the world to see her, to view her, to view the other lots. And, um, as the Scottsdale show was going on and, and word was sort of spreading on who was interested in the bidding on this Philly, we, the people that, you know, were kind of working on this kind of realized it was going to be huge. Mm. And, um, and it was, I mean, they, there was no reserve on her, so it, you can watch it actually. Um, I think on, we, online, online. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's several, it's, it's really amazing to watch. We, we did a Facebook live, so you can watch it on our Facebook page. Um, go back to, it was, it was February, gosh, was it 24th or 28th? Okay. Of 2017. 2017. Uh-huh. And there's a Facebook live of the entire event and it is amazing. It's that, amazing. That would be fun. So mm-hmm. lots of bitters. Lots it, of she, noise. she went up in hundred thousand dollar increments. Oh my goodness! In like, like that, and then they stopped it at like nine hundred thousand, and then you know, and she was walking around on the stage and just. That's right. She's got to be patient through all this. Stuff. And she, how did she take it? She took it like like the star, like the she star is. she is. Yeah. She, I mean, she took yeah. everything. She took traveling to Scottsdale and getting conditioned there, and you know, all the presentations to all the different potential buyers. She just took it like. Like, uh, like an old soul. Like an old soul. It was amazing. And the, what the, she was worth. Mm-hmm. And there was a preview um, a few days before the sale, and it, she, she was amazing. I mean, she was eight months old, really a baby, and mm-hmm. she walked around with no fear mm-hmm. and those beautiful big eyes, just like um, like an old soul. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Mm-hmm. And um, anyway, so she um, she sold for one point five five million dollars. There's the punchline. There's the There's punchline. The, <laughs> yeah. $1.55 million for a baby. And that's the most any Arabian has gone through a sale at that age. For that, I, I don't know if any Arabian has ever been sold at eight months old for $1.55 million. And she was unshown, un, unproven. Uh-huh. I mean, barely a more than a week. I mean, she wasn't really even a yearling. She was a, a tall weanling, mm-hmm. really. Um, so it was... It was really one of the most um, sort of emotional moments I've ever been through. I mean, first of all, you know, the adrenaline kind of rushing through as this is happening. Second of all, um, the knowledge that this was one of was a creation with of, of mine and my mom's, and you know, feeling sort of my mom's presence during it, but wishing she were truly there with me, um, letting go of Aridite. That's a hard one. That's a hard one. That's a really hard one. And I'm not one. I mean, yes, the money's wonderful. The money's really, really wonderful. And it lets me breed horses without worrying about anything for a while. You know, um, it's really, really wonderful. But letting go of a, a special filly like that is not easy. Um, having said that, she's she was bought by Patricia Dempsey, uh, a breeder from um, Florida, who, uh, which is, it's amazing too. I mean, there were shakes bidding from all over the world. And then an American woman is, is the one that That's awesome. wanted her the most. Yeah. And I had, and I knew I met with, with Pat Dempsey the week before. And she said, as long as there's no funny business going on, she was going to buy her. So I just said, I hope she doesn't think that there's any funny business going on <laughs> because I really wanted the Philly to go to her. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she's, she's with an American trainer with Ted Carson, um, owned by Pat Dempsey and they, he should, will never be sold and she'll have the best yeah. home and, um, really great care. And so they brought her to the world cup in Las Vegas in, uh, just two weeks ago. It was in April and, um, she was gold champion yearling Philly. So that was really nice too. It was nice for, you know, for just everybody involved yeah. to have her. And she, and she was still so much younger than everybody else in her class. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so How is she filling out though. She's she still looks immature. She's very, very, very tall, and she's so incredibly beautiful. I mean, I think uh, she'll be a really she'll be at her best when she's you know seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, our horses mature kind of later, and 
um, are always better when they're a little bit older. And mm-hmm. so she's already so special. So it's going to be yeah, really great to watch, to watch her. Awesome mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So tell us for those listeners who don't know a lot about the show ring with the Arabians and a lot of us watch endurance, a lot of us writers, mm-hmm. we know, we know how the Arabians own endurance mm-hmm. pretty much. Uh, but tell us about the show ring. Tell us what they're looking for out there. Uh, I, I don't know that they can. There's nothing you need to say more about the auction. She's right. just gorgeous. She's gorgeous. But the sh- in the show ring now. Well, so um, so we breed. We what we do is we breed foundation stock for other people and also high end show horses. And um, all, our horses are also good performance horses. And you know we we have horses that go into endurance and all those other aspects too. But the main, the main goal is to breed, um, these, the type, the Aridite types. Mm-hmm. And, um, so I guess, I guess it sounds so anticlimactic, but I guess it's a little bit like a dog show. Yeah. So, <laughs> but it, it's a halter class, yeah. but it's, but you're, you're looking for, you're not looking for a quiet little wallflower. No, <laughs> there's par- So they get judged. Um, the number one thing they get judged on is Arabian type. And so Arabian type is not just a pretty face. It's not just tail carriage. It's not just movement. And it's not just the overall sort of quality. Mm-hmm. It's also their attitude. Mm-hmm. And um, and Arabian type, you know, you want them to use their tail. You want them to move well. You want them to maybe snort and blow a little bit as they're not in a crazy kind of a way, but in a here I am, I'm showing you how gorgeous I am kind of a way. Okay. So that's... Um, especially in the European and sort of Middle Eastern show rings, they have a scoring system that's a little bit different than here. Um, type is sort of the number one thing that they look at. Okay. Um, and then, and then of course we have in some, uh, on some scorecards is head and then neck or head and neck is one. Okay. And then the body and top line, um, movement and legs. Am I missing anything? I think that's it. So, um, that's kind of the international standard. Okay. And so, well, you're setting it. So I'm glad to hear, <laughs> I'm glad to hear it from you. Yeah. So that's what, they, that's what, that's what we look for. Um, we, we personally don't go to very many shows. Mm. We really just go to Scottsdale sometimes and to the Vegas show. And then we had a really wonderful show here in the San Diego Valley called the Arabian Full Festival, which uh, they had, I think it, it was only three or four years, but it was so fun to just go to a show that was local. That was easy. Mm. Um, we need to get that started again. Um, but we try not to show at too many shows. We'd like to have people come and, you know, get horses from us and then they end up doing I that. So this is actually kind of exciting. We've been tallying up. So our foundation mayor, her name is Estopa. My mother bought her in Spain, um, in the early seventies. She is, has become one of the most influential mayors in history, um, through this breeding program. Mm-hmm. And so, for example, at the world championships last year, there are, there's yearling, there's a yearling world champion, a junior, so yearly male and female. So yearling male and female, then a junior male and female, and then a senior male and female. So that's, um, and they do bronze, silver, and gold. So that's 18 possible championships. Gotcha. So in Paris last year at the world championship, 14 of the 18 possible world champions had a stopa in their pedigree. That's amazing. Okay. That's foundational. That's, that's amazing, <laughs> right? It's amazing. It I should say I'm sitting in a, a, a room off the, the uh, main arena here and the barn that is literally wallpapered with ribbons and, um, every kind of award that I suppose that you can win <laughs> in your industry. Yeah. So what happened to the industry in between, you know, you know, when, when this was all going on and your mom was building a, a such a legacy, why, why did it lull? You know, I guess Reagan tax laws is that was kind it? of, I mean, that's what we all kind of blame it on. Was it? It, <laughs> so, was, it was that bringing you, down of mm-hmm. that. Uh huh. Yeah. You know, like we lost all those people that were doing it for investment reasons. Gotcha. I mean, I guess they weren't just doing it for investment reasons. They were also passionate about it, but yeah. they, they could, but they were they using, could, they were it, using it as a sure. tax sure. break. So that sort of pulled the rug out from under that. Cause mm-hmm. I, you know, it did. other industries, this happened in too. The thoroughbred industry mm-hmm. is what we were doing in the eighties and nineties. Yeah. So I'm familiar with yeah. that industry going sideways. Um, mm-hmm. And I think I think there are things that are beginning to change, not just economically, but with the uh, the breeds too. I think in the thoroughbred industry, we're seeing changes being made, like whoa, which is water hay oats, um, meaning they're they're 
tamping down drug use. You know, I hope they take the whips out too. I'm putting a plug in for that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are things that they're starting to become more about the public perception right. than they, than they and used to we be. need to do that too, mm -hmm. um, especially in the Arabian halter scene, okay. especially in the United States. Um, I think we all kind of get a little bit, we get stuck in our own little, um, you know, our own little niche in the industry and, and you get a little bit complacent about how it may look towards to the public that isn't in that. I mean, it's the same yeah. with the jockeys and the whips, you know, it'd be the halter trainers. They have whips too. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. you know, so it, we have some issues like that, that are, that people are working on to fix. Um, I, I, uh, well, that's why we're here educating too. Mm -hmm. Cause I, I think, you know, the more people understand yeah. about, yeah. Um, either an industry or especially yeah. a breed, yeah. the, the, the more it helps. Absolutely. And I, and I feel like people that are maybe interested in getting into Arabian breeding, um, it's important to find a mentor mm. that um, can help. Mm -hmm. And it's important, obviously, to find the right mentor so that you're not, I don't know, getting stuck going with sideways. going yeah. sideways. Yeah. And that obviously can happen in any industry. It can. Uh, you it know, can. I think horsemanship can go down the route of mm -hmm. being fair to the horses. Well, and absolutely. I mean, your family is, that's what you guys are famous for is Pretty teaching much, yeah. people. Trying to be fair with the horse. Yeah. yeah. And, and I don't, and I don't know what we're famous for it, but we're sure out there trying. Sure, sure out there trying. And, and I actually, um, sort of, I'm sort of in the process of trying to figure out how to get a little bit of a mentorship program mentorship program going for people that are wanting to get into, or that are already maybe breeders and just want a little bit of support. Yeah. And we're going to, um, I don't know the dates yet, but there's a, a judge, an international judge, her name is Cindy Reich, and she works at, at the Kellogg Ranch at, at Pomona University, or actually it's Cal Poly University at, at Pomona, I should say that right. Okay. And um, she's going to come and do like a, a, sorry, a week and seminar here. Oh, good. Um, teaching people how to evaluate Arabian horses. Perfect. And we'll do some live judging. And um, so for those of you interested in that, we will um, advertise that on our website and also on our Facebook page at some point soon. But I'm going to start doing little things like that to just sort of help, especially the newbies, but also mm -hmm. people that are, um, had I've been doing it for a long time. Yeah. I'm super excited to take her course actually. See, there you go. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. think it'll be great. It's great always to just sort of see, you know, maybe how another person views a horse because they may see things that aren't terribly, like, I don't think they're terribly important, but maybe they are important, you know, and it's nice to, to be able to just, I don't know, open your mind and learn a little bit you more. You sound like a wonderful person to lead this industry. <laughs> I, I think, you know, with an open mind like that, I think it's wonderful. Oh. You're the new breed. I'm, um, I would love to have you back on this too. There's so many things I'd love to get to. Um, I mean, you're such a great blend of the old and the new with this foundation that you've brought through this foundation mayor, even one of her sons, I think is ended up being a foundation, um, stallion. If I remember correctly, I'm not sure on that. That I mean, her church. Yes, there's so many. Yes. Yeah, prodigy. Yes. But probably El Shaklan. You're probably talking about El Shaklan. Yes, mm -hmm. I am. You're right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's he's a very famous guy. And you know, we I grew up. Um, this you may not be aware of this. I grew up right down the road um, till we were in. I think I was in the second grade with Sheila Varian. Mm -hmm. So the Varian mm -hmm. brand, you know, and mm -hmm. and and all her Arabs were a big part of our showing yeah. and um, taking those. Arabs onto the trail and yeah. into the show ring yeah. and reining yeah. and ca working cow horse and everything yeah. was, Ronteza was yeah. just amazing. And you know, in 1983, Sheila Varian bought a stallion from us, actually only half interest. So we kept 50% and she kept 50%. His name is Sanity Al Shaklan. And he would, he spent always a year with her and a year with us. And so there is like actually quite a bit of Omel Arab at, in the Varian uh, I don't doubt it. And the very don't doubt breed it, you too. both have such beautiful horses. Yeah. That makes sense. And if you backtrack Aerodite's um, sire, um, that line goes back to Sheila's too. So, so yeah. Yes, yeah. So that that's great? fun. That is great. Mm -hmm. I, I feel honored that I know <laughs> both of these families. You guys are great. What I'd love to do is have you back sometime. And I'd like to debunk some myths about Perfect. Arabians. What do you think? Let's do it. Okay. Hi, Carol Herter here, president of Cavallo, home of the world's most trusted and popular hoof boots. You know, one of the most interesting parts of what I do is the many horsey stories I get to hear. Most of them are really uplifting. Some are stories of challenges and a few are downright sad. 
Recently, a wonderful woman took the time to approach us at a show to share a story about her horse who went down in quicksand. It started out as a really scary story. We were holding our breaths, waiting for the outcome, and it turned out wonderful. They winched the horse out relatively unscathed, albeit, you know, a little traumatized, and everyone standing around were super amazed that he still had his cavallo hoof boots on. Scary story with a good ending. Another testament to Cavallo. If you don't have a pair for your horse, it's time. Cavallos are easy to put on, easy to take off when you want to take them off, and they stay on. They stay on in all terrain. Cavallo, the world's most trusted hoof boots. Cece Baudette Wellman founded Happy Endings Animal Rescue Sanctuary in December of 2007 in the San Inez Valley in California. She has had a long career with horses and all kinds of animals, including exotic animals, and saving domestic animals who would otherwise have been euthanized. Well, welcome, Cece Baudette Wellman from high school. How are you? Fine, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to have you. It's actually, I'm remiss in not having you because you're such a great horsewoman. And Aww. on Horsemanship Radio, I love having good horsewomen. And so I wanted to talk a little bit today about your background, some of the things that you grew up with, and some of the reasons that you are and you found your way to where you are right now with a sanctuary. It's a wonderful thing. Thank you very much. You know, one thing I researched and I found out that I didn't know about you is before we met, you were up in the Monterey area, uh, Monterey, California. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. And what were you? You were just a baby then. No, you were what? I was five years old. You're five. I was five years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father had uh, started a marine biological research foundation wow. uh, in the San Inez Valley, and obviously, it was very difficult to do anything marine biology wise in a valley. So uh, he decided to move up to the Carmel Monterey area, uh, where he had lived previously uh, in his youth. And uh, found a wonderful old uh, warehouse building in Moss Landing. And, it's a nice area. Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. And so um, we moved to Carmel and rented a house there uh, on Isabella Avenue. And then ended up moving to Carmel Valley on Eddy Road. Mm, that's a nice area. So you were originally from the San Inez Valley and then just went five to how long were you up in Monterey? Um, I was, uh, I came back when I was 12. I had just turned 13. Okay. And that's about the time or slight, slightly after that, just shortly after that we met, I yes. think. Yeah. Yes. Our, our but I troubled was, teens. I was, you know, going back and forth. So were you? I think we met before I actually moved, technically moved back. So when did you get into horses? I got into horses. I was probably four. Oh, not till you were four, huh? You were just <laughs> learning to walk and talk before that. <laughs> well, I uh, apparently, according to all of my mother's friends who were big horse people, um, I whinnied better than any filly <laughs> on any ranch anywhere. <laughs> You hear that, boy? She had a good whinny. I love that. <laughs> Everybody would say, oh, my God, the horses are out. And my mom would say, oh, no, it's just Cece. Cece. <laughs> we can hear her from here. <laughs> well, we met at a time when, you know, all all good horses should want to belong to 12-year-old or 13-year-old girls because it's a great time to get to know horses and to be around horses. Who was your favorite horse around that 12, 13 age? Wow, Did that's a hard one? question. Um, I think there was a there was a horse that my godfather gave me. He was out of a, a thoroughbred stallion. Uh, I mean, out of a, a funny little quarter horse mare that was not registered and looked kind of funky. Um, and by his uh, thoroughbred stallion Kirby, Um and he asked me if I wanted, you know, a horse because my uncle. Uh, who had running quarters um, and owned a stallion named Leobar, was afraid I was get hurt and he didn't want to be responsible. Mm -hmm. So he didn't want to give me a horse. So when my godfather asked me if I wanted a horse and he said, which one do you want on the ranch? And I pointed at this funky little mare and I said, I want the one in there. 
And so when uh, Sean was born, um, I was the first human that he saw. Oh, love that. So he was my favorite horse. Yeah. We, we raised you, each other. Yeah, exactly. You bonded <laughs> and you raised each other. Yes. That's great. That's great. But it, it, that was not the only animal in your life. Horses were not the only animals. I mean, you've already had marine exposure. Um, you did a lot of rescuing as a kid too. other animals. Yes, I did. Uh, mostly uh, things that would fall out of a nest yeah. or uh, kittens that were you know, abandoned or sometimes, uh, people had, uh, dogs that were not correct and they didn't know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, we would take them. You took them in. Did you have, do you have a farm, a ranch or something? We had, we had a rather large piece of property. Mm -hmm. Yes. I see. I see. And do you remember, I mean, that time growing up in the San Inez Valley, was um, kind of a transition time that was before a lot of the wine had come in here. Now we have lots of grapes and lots of wine farmers, uh, grape farmers. And uh, there was a lot more wild animals, I think, then. You know, I mean, people used to bring deer in all the time. They were the, maybe the mama was hit by a car and the babies were brought to us and we fed them out of bottles or yogurt or whatever. Do you remember that? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> and um, I spent many of time in a stall nursing babies um, back to health and hoping that they would not imprint on me so that they could make it out in the wild. Um, I really felt responsible uh, that most of the animals that I got were, in fact, victims of human uh just no. being human yeah. and being in their area. Maybe not the best judgments. And, right. Yeah. And uh, so that I wanted to make it right. Mm-hmm. I wanted to give them back and I wanted to somehow make it right. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I spent a lot of time with the animals. Uh, I had a rather difficult teenagehood, so to speak, and my animals were my sanctuary. So and they were my psychiatrists and my mm-hmm. friends and, you know, that if I could be a better person so that my animals thought more highly of me, that's what I was striving to do. Oh, that's a wonderful thing. I think a lot of people would, yeah, are leaning in right now listening <laughs> to that and can relate to that. One thing that fascinated me was when this lady named Pat Derby moved into the valley and um, started, was it the Wild Animal Park? It was a Wild Animal Park. Yeah. And she had shows. Um, she was an animal trainer and an exotic animal trainer for the movies. She had worked, uh, down, uh, at a big wild animal park, uh, down south. Um, and the more that she trained exotic animals, the more that she realized what kind of a horrible effect that, uh, animals were having, uh, especially when they were not of use anymore. Mm. And what do you do with an angry, old, grumpy tiger that's in pain? Mm. Uh, what what do you do with them? And, um, and how do you manage them properly? Mm-hmm. And eventually she um, decided that she didn't want to train animals anymore, that she wanted to rescue them. Mm. So... She was definitely was she my hero. Yeah, I was going to say, she must be an inspiration. Yeah. Yes, she was. Uh, she's my lifetime hero. Yeah. Um, did she Did she share with you some of her gifts, some of her talents? Oh, absolutely. I was so honored to be uh, sort of taken under her wing. Uh, she was about four foot nothing, uh, had crazy red hair yeah. <laughs> and a temper to match and um, had the biggest heart of anybody that I'd ever known. Uh, She was the first one that realized that people needed to wake up a little bit and they needed to be educated about these animals Mm -hmm. and what their needs were and what their emotional state was, which was kind of a groundbreaking concept at that time. And so she did part of her show. She had a lion that lay down with a lamb. And it made just that one little five-minute section made such an impact on so many people 
that uh, it sort of revolutionized people's way of thinking about training, uh, that it wasn't all cracking whips and making them afraid uh, to, you know, bow down to what you wanted them to do. It was more of a partnership. And if they loved you and they trusted you and they respected you and you were their, their unconditional leader, that they did whatever you wanted to because they wanted to and they loved you. Mm-hmm. And even out of their nature. Yes. Yeah, out in the wild. Yes. I love that. And, and what you just described is the difference. You put down a carnivore with a flight animal. And we always talk about our horses as flight animals. And a lot of people relate more to carnivores because they're around dogs and cats a lot. So how did that leap from really, I know you were all animal lover, but um, what did you have to change about your demeanor, if anything, to go from training horses or loving your horses to working with something like a tiger? Well, basically what I realized uh, with Pat's help is I had to do away with every traditional ideology and every training concept method that I had ever been taught because it really wasn't appropriate. It was outdated. Um, it was created out of ignorance really for what lack is, of a better, what's an example of something? Um, <clears throat> the fear factor, uh, creating fear factor to get an animal that is bigger and more powerful than you are to, uh, comply with your wishes, uh, because if you, if they did not, you would give them, you know, yelling, or, yeah, or yanking, or or okay. inflict pain on yeah. them. Inflict pain, yeah. yes, yeah. So you drew the line there, and absolutely, back up it, yeah. And uh, so I decided that <clears throat> if I could figure out how to speak their language, not necessarily a verbal language, uh, that I had a much better way of going even just around the building, so to speak, uh, and have a relationship with this animal instead of I'm the counselor and you're the dummy. Mm. Um, it was actually a partnership. Um, and, and so much more could be accomplished. Mm, Um, and the most important thing, which everyone should be concerned about, whether you're working with a, huge tiger or a horse or an elephant or whatever is safety. And when something loves you and trusts you and um, respects you, you're safer than if you're working with something that's afraid. Strong point. That's a really (laughs) good idea. Really good idea. Do you remember Chauncey? Oh, yes. Tell me about some of the animals. Well, gosh, there was Chauncey. and Chauncey was the Mercury Bobcat. I mean, the Mercury Cougar, yes. Some people will remember him. Yes. Was Chauncey a her or him? I can't remember now. But uh, the Mercury Cougar on the the Mercury Lincoln Mercury car commercials. Yes. People will remember that. Yes, it was the Mercury car. There was a... Was it Lincoln? No, I don't think either. It was just Mercury, and uh, and then uh, they had the uh, the Bobcat, the Mercury Bobcat too, and I cannot remember his name to save my life. That was Pat Derby's as well. Yes. Yeah. And then she had um, and the tiger was Raja. Raja was the tiger, mm-hmm. and then there was another one. Oh gosh, I can't think of. She his had name. an elephant. Started with a B. I think too for um, a short while. For a short while. Yeah. Um, but, uh, what happened was that they did not get the proper funding that they needed. Mm -hmm. They didn't get enough work to support their animals Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they didn't get the proper funding that they needed. It must be tough to support them, uh, supporting one, actually one Bengal tiger for one day costs about 400 to $500. For Back one. in the day or, <clears throat> yeah. Well, yeah. like right now. Right now. Only. even Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's a lot of money. It is a, a lot, lot of money. Of money. Yeah. And then you, you know, multiply that with how many animals that they have. Yes, they did. Um, and they had some big carnivores. And um, so some unfortunate things happen uh, trying to get food uh, for them. And uh, Pat ended up going off on her own after Ted died mm. and uh, moving up north and she got some people together and they started a nonprofit mm. 
called the Performing Animal Welfare Society. Oh, so she, she turned into a pause. Oh, yes. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And so, so she... A sanctuary? A sanctuary, uh-huh. absolutely, for uh, performing animals, mm-hmm. retired um, or animals really that were stuck in cages. They had a dead end future. Mm-hmm. Uh, People couldn't afford their animals, um, especially lots of people in the Midwest um, are allowed to have exotic animals. And uh, it's so very did she disappointing. Inspire, yeah, yeah. <laughs> did she inspire you to eventually, so fast forward now, you have your own sanctuary. Tell us the name. Absolutely. Uh, we we continued to be friends, and uh, she was always the one that would listen to me, and I was never afraid that she would pass judgment on me. Um, So I would kind of just whine at her a lot, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, as most teenagers do. Um, And eventually, uh, she tried to tell me that I needed to get back into animals. Um, I had moved to Los Angeles to do uh, to get into uh, modeling and acting, and uh, because my mother and my grandmother were all both in the industry, and for some reason, just because I had the same name, I had this preconceived idea that it was you know genetic, something that I should be doing. <laughs> um, and what I did was I would take breaks, um, and I would run up and I would uh, volunteer for Tippi Hedren. Um, with oh, her exotic that's animals. Right. And, Tippi Hedren, um, um, so the birds people will remember. Yeah. Tippi um, and so I, it was just sort of a natural progression and she kept saying, Oh, you know, you've got to do something and you've got to, and I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. Um, and I moved back to, uh, I got really done with the city. I'm not a city person. Uh, no matter how much I tried to pretend I was, I really was not a big city person. And so I moved back to San Inez, uh, drizzle, 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 drone. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I I came home and, um, there was no, there were no uh, exotic animals. So I decided to go back to my wildlife rescuing. Um, and in those days there was hardly any fishing game, uh, wardens around or anything and so everybody would just continue to bring things to me here fix this or here i found this or Mm -hmm. here do something and Mm -hmm. um i went to santa barbara one year in uh, 1995 i believe and they had their first earth day and there was a very very small group of ladies in this little table and they were forming an organization called Santa Barbara Wildlife Care Network. And I looked at them and my eyes lit up and I said, bingo, I'm home. <laughs> this is where I belong here. Um, <clears throat> and I could actually get a permit, yeah. uh, be under their permit. And I didn't have to do any of the paperwork, which is just peachy. And... Um, so I was the only wildlife rehabilitation person in the San Inez Valley wow. for 20, 22 years at least. Mm. Um, and uh, well, Tell us a little about the sanctuary now. Um, you have horses. I have mostly horses. Mostly horses. We started taking, you know, dogs and cats and birds and all sorts of things. And I realized very quickly that the greatest need was for horses. Yeah. And uh, since my one of my favorite things in the world is a horse, mm-hmm. um, that that was a very natural progression. And I had I'd always had horses. Um, I don't think I'd ever really been without owning a horse Mm -hmm. my whole life, Mm -hmm. except before I was four. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one horse came and two horses came and three horses came. (laughs) And it is a sanctuary. These are not, they're not bringing them to fix up and move on out for repurposing. No. Well, uh, most of the horses that I have, the majority of them, uh, are old Mm -hmm. And they are labeled unwanted mm. 
by the majority of humans. Yeah. Um, not to me, but right. to the majority of yeah. people. Yeah. Um, they are not writable. They uh, have no use anymore. Uh, their usefulness has gone. Mm. Uh, but the spark in their eye and their love of life is not gone. Not gone, yeah. And so um, they come and live with me. Yeah. And they are loved and spoiled and uh, yeah. they have a they have a job. Mm-hmm. We have programs that we educate people on the care and respect for animals, hoping that if I educate enough people that the incidence of neglect and abuse will be lessened. Right. Um, and it actually has worked. Uh, as far as the numbers go, as far as animal control goes, mm-hmm. uh, there have been uh, fewer incidences. Uh, in this valley. That's so right. um, my my plan is to educate the children who go home and educate the parents. Yes. Um, and Get that next uh, and generation going. Thus, right? Yes. Yeah. And starting a domino effect. Which Do is, you teach well, kids? That's great. That's a great thought. Do you teach kids uh, the... What do you teach them? Do you do? You, is it mostly about the horse training, behaviors, grooming, nutrition? I do all of those things. Okay, so we me. do everything except on board. We do not yeah, have okay. riding program just okay. because our horses are sure, old and they have retired. arthritis. And how do you teach kids the value of how much it costs to maintain a horse? Seems to me that's one of the missing things these days that people don't have a realistic idea of what it costs to maintain a horse, right? Well, kids are um, have a Barbie mentality, for lack of a better <laughs> okay. explanation, and their views of reality are not formed yet. So when I speak of having to work. Uh, in my childhood to support my horse, um, they just go, yeah, 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 whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, And things have changed. There are not that many children who own horses these days who are mucking stalls, who are uh, cleaning other people's stalls, who are grooming other people's horses. Um, They're not even really grooming their own. It seems that there's a lot of kids who get on and ride and hand the reins to someone else and say, here, take care of my horse. Uh, And to me, that's that's too bad because it's robbing them of something that's so vitally important, Um, and that is the responsibility. You have a responsibility, if you're a horse owner, to that horse's life uh, and the quality of that horse's life. And if you want to do your best in a show ring or... Do your best on a trail ride and stay safe or be able to ride well enough and trust your horse well enough that you can tie your reins at a knot and look at birds of prey and beautiful clouds and things and not worry about the next thing that's going to jump out of a bush. Um, you have to have a response. You have to have a relationship with your horse. Uh, and you can't do that if you pop on, ride, and then get off. Exactly. Well said. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your certainly your life now with horses. And I hope we can have you back, too, to talk about individual horses and different stories that you have, too. I but tell like- us how people can um, find your sanctuary, maybe support you in your sanctuary. Well, that would be wonderful. We are a 501c3 charity. Um, our website is www.happyendingsanimalrescuesanctuary.org. Okay. And we are on Facebook yes. with Happy Endings Animal Sanctuary. Um, and we are always... Can people come visit? Absolutely. Okay. Just give me a call. I would okay. be more than happy to give a tour. Uh, because I'm more or less of a one man show or one woman show, yeah. an old one old woman show, <laughs> um, I can't be all places at all times. So um, everybody needs to call me and make sure that I'm around. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. But, but she's we, not. I know she doesn't leave much, so she's not far away. <laughs> thank you, Cece, for well, being thank you, Debbie. a guest on thank the you show. So much. I appreciate I'm you. very, very grateful. Thank you so much. Whisper. Of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call 
Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place than mine. The magic in the language of the Dear Monty, watching our horses as a group is an interesting bit of sociology. In particular, I'm struck how the former boss of the herd, an old mare by the name of Kitten, during my teenage years, is no longer the boss. A younger working horse, Deuce, is now clearly the head honcho. How does this transformation take place? Monty's answer. Most of my life has been devoted to a great interest in behavior and the social order of the family groups of flight animals. Obviously, horses have been my main focus. I remember so well how surprised I was to find that the stallion was not the primary decision maker within wild horse families. I like to tell my students that it isn't so much different from people. We men think to, tend to think that we run the show when, in fact, a smaller, physically weaker woman really does. And I think it's quite valid that the important decisions made for the human family often rest on the shoulders of the mother. I wrote in my first book about my experiences with wild deer. I explained how my first relationship with a deer was with one I call Grandma. She was a textbook matriarch, spending about 10 months out of the year helping to raise the fawns of other does and keeping social order within the family group. This toothless old doe was still making the important decisions for the safety of this small herd well past the time when she had any offspring of her own. Grandma died of natural causes while still holding the position of matriarchal leader. Where horses are concerned, my experiences have shown me that the lead mare certainly shoulders the bulk of the duties regarding social order. It seems to me that, very much like the deer family, the equine family shows the matriarch a great deal of respect that seems to last well into the autumn of the life of the alpha mare. Unlike the deer, however, I believe that the horse family tends to read the female leader, and when she's no longer physically capable of staying up with the herd and assisting in its health and safety, will allow a younger mare to take over this position. Typically, this is a peaceful exchange of power, and often it is passed from mother to daughter if circumstances allow for that transition. This is one of the areas that I feel needs to be addressed where Mustang capture is concerned, as this is often done in a manner that disrupts the smooth flow of social order. The transition of male leadership is, in my opinion, less important than the exchange of female leadership, but certainly that is an important factor as well. It is commendable that you have made your observations, and I thank you for being interested enough to ask the question. You are in a position to continue your observations and draw conclusions about the individuals in your group. If more horse people choose to understand the social needs of our equine partners, it is likely that we would come to understand them better and develop a more compassionate approach to the relationship we have with them. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to www.montyroberts.com and click on the orange banner that says, Get Free Horse Tips. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged, July 10 through 21 this summer, Gentling Wild Horses Course in California at Flag is Up Farms. And then July 31st to August 1st, our annual Monty Special Training in California. That'll be on Flag is Up Farms, and that'll be in two languages, both Portuguese for our Brazilian friends and any Portuguese friends, and also in English, which is what Monty speaks. And you can find all of that and so much more at montyroberts.com, the website, or you can give them a call there at Flag is Up Farm. Lots of friendly folks there. The phone number is 805-688-6288. And for details about today's show, you can find them at horsemanshipradio.com, and we'll have links, photos, and more information about our guests. And we love your feedback. It helps us make this show better. Please follow mm-hmm. us on Facebook. And Monty Roberts' Facebook is, guess this, Monty Roberts. How about that? Yeah, who knew? Who knew? (laughs) And you can follow him on Twitter. His handle on Twitter is Monty underscore Roberts. So uh, get get a hold of Monty and follow him on both of those. And we'd love to see your suggestions, topics you'd love to hear hear us talk about, or guests you think would be cool, or questions you might have. We'd love to answer. 
And you can get the app and not miss any episodes of Horsemanship Radio or any other Horse Radio Network episode, for that matter. Uh, Go to your app store and search Horse Radio Network, and you can get it for your iPhone or your Android. The app is free and easy to use. It is. And many thanks to our sponsors, Omega Fields, Cavallo Horse and Rider, and Monty's Equus Online University. Be sure to visit all those other great shows Jen was talking about, too, on the Horse Radio Network at www.horseradionetwork.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours. 